I'm Terry Tucker, Associate Director of IPCALS. Uh, before introducing today's topic and panel moderator, let me recognize and thank Ralph Christie. I don't know whether Ralph is here. Is he? No? Okay. Uh, for faithfully carrying on and enhancing this uh, seminar series uh, that began back in the 1990s. Uh, over the years, the series has benefited from the unwavering support of three directors of CFAD, Norm Upoff, Alice Pell, and most recently, Ralph Christie. Uh, and importantly, it's reflected the ideas and the professional connections of faculty and students, past and present, uh, who have participated in this. And some of these uh, people that are here today uh, I think have attended probably 90% of the CFAD seminars uh, uh, over the past 20-some uh, years. Uh, now, since this series has also uh, long been offered for graduate credit uh, across multiple graduate fields, uh, let me just make a, a quick uh, 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 announcement about that. If you want to sign up for uh, graduate credit and you haven't done so already, uh, speak with Kanan. Is Kanan here? Yep. See Kanan. Uh, also... There's a sign-up sheet in the back, and there will be a sign-up sheet in the back every Wednesday that we meet. Uh, and it's important to recognize the time and energy that's essentially volunteered by countless faculty and staff over the years that have, have organized this and, and uh, led the discussion sessions that meet uh, at another time and read the papers and so on that, that students uh, 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 present. So... In the past, it's been uh, Ralph, Julie Lauren, Louise Buck, Peter Hobbs with, with Peter's retirement and, and Ralph's return to full-time departmental duties in Dyson School. Uh, Sarah and I will, will join Julie and Louise this year in, in carrying that out. Uh, and, and Ginny moved, for those that were used to seeing Ginny Montopoli in the back corner there, uh, Ginny's moved to development sociology uh, now, so we're looking to and receiving great planning and logistical support from Kane and Boyer and Anna Hammond. Uh, so for a lot of us, getting together on a Wednesday midday uh, has become sort of a, a tradition, uh, getting together with faculty and colleagues and, and students to engage with a, with a speaker. Um, and CFAD's uh, roughly 27-year run, I guess, uh, has, has wound down and concluded this calendar year, but, but two of its... Uh, sort of uh, most visible programs, or at least most visible in, in recent years, will continue. So the SMART program is moving to Dyson, and Ralph Christie will maintain leadership of that. And then this seminar series, as I mentioned, becomes the IPCAL seminar series. Same place, same time, same coffee, tea, and conversation over refreshments. Uh, and it's fitting that that uh, this first seminar in the newly rebranded IPCAL seminar series feature a panel organized and moderated by the director of IPCALS, Ronnie Kaufman. Uh, Ronnie is the Andrew H. and James S. Tisch Distinguished University Professor. He's an international professor of plant breeding and genetics, director of IPCALS. In his various past lives, he's been Chair of the Department of Plant Breeding, Associate Dean of Research in Cal's Plant Breeder at Erie, and a hardworking Kentucky farm boy. Uh, and uh, he's going to introduce the panelists, all of them, like Ronnie, early student participants in a well-known Cal's course that's celebrating its 50th anniversary this year. Ronnie? Well, I'm the youngster of this group. I'm only 49 years ago that I participated in this court. But we have people here that go back 50 years. And one of them had a little trouble getting here last night, Janet, Janet Splitter. Uh, she's from Kansas these days. Great Bend, Kansas, right? Is it still, is that close? <laughs> it's hard to be precise in Kansas, you know. So uh, she was on the first course in uh, January of 1968, and with her was Chris Ween, who was a distinguished professor here and still a distinguished emeritus professor and now abides down in Maryland somewhere, right? Annapolis. Annapolis, yeah. 
And then we have two fellow travelers from uh, the 1968 course, Bill, Bill Fry, who spent several years, as many as, almost as many as me here as a, in fact, more than me as a faculty member in the plant pathology department in various positions uh, in the college. And Don Cass, who was a fellow traveler last night, Three flights you had, Don, except for the last one, which was. <laughs> so, so, so Don and Janet had to take a, an overnight limousine from Philadelphia. You know how famous Philadelphia is. So it lived up to its reputation last night. You do anything not to spend the night in Philadelphia. So, so I don't know. How many people in here are alumni or form or faculty, former or present of IARD 602? There must be quite a few. Yeah. So, so what we'll do? I'm not going to reminisce uh, any here because I don't want to steal any of the thunder of the invited participants. So we'll go in the order that you see uh, on on the screen. Uh, three of them have uh, slides. There's a separation. Uh, between them, and then uh, we'll have a uh, we'll line up here and have a discussion. If you have questions or comments, and KV, you can be. Re We've got a guy who's been running this course for 17 years, KV Raman, the last 17 years, which have operated in India. So KV, you might want to make some comments afterwards about the current uh, course and, and some of the uh, uh, activities. So let's start with. Janet, who's going to lead us off with 1968. Well, first off, I want to thank Cornell and the Cornell faculty for all the support they've provided. It's been above and beyond, and that's a whole nother story. <laughs> New York Times correspondent John F. Burns, um, when he retired in 2015, he wrote about his... Um, talked about his 40 years as a correspondent covering world events. He talked about visiting a friend of his who was a fellow journalist, and the, fellow, the journalist said to him, never forget, it's not how far you traveled, it's what you brought back. Never forget, it's not how far you traveled, but what you brought back. And I think that's the vision and the goal that the founders of this tour or trip that we talk about, I think that's what they wanted for each one of us, what we brought back. And that's very personal and very individual. So how did I get on this trip? That's uh, the first class. And as you may recognize, some of us are not. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Nope. <laughs> oh, there we go. Yeah. There we go. Okay. Mel and I were just married. And uh, he had completed his master's degree in uh, the cult or drought tolerance in corn. And I had just completed my ma uh, bachelor's degree in horticulture from Kansas State <coughs> University. In August of 1968, we went to the American Society of Agronomy, and Mel interviewed for graduate positions. Dr. Uh, Clarence Grogan was a Cornell plant breeder, and he was there interviewing, and he was quite interested in Mel's research in drought tolerance because it was genetically related to cold tolerance, and Dr. Grogan was working on cold tolerance, and that was important in developing countries. So he was very interested in having Mel come, and uh, then there was a, the promise of international agriculture research in the program. He was so interested in having us come that he found money for Mel and I to come visit Cornell <coughs> and see the programs and uh, visit the corn pro program. So in January 1967, 1967, we were here. Um, Mel was um, a student of, of Dr. Grogan's in plant breeding, a graduate student, and I was a student in food science in 
one of Dr. Scheib, Frank Scheib's uh, graduate students in food science. So how did I get on the trip? Well, I married the right guy. <laughs> January, let's see, let me see. January 16th, 1968, we left Willard Strait Hall at 1 a.m. in the morning to go, on, and we rode on a bus to JFK. By 9 p.m. that evening, we were, well, okay, January. It was 10 degrees here and snowy. 9 p.m. that evening, we were uh, at a reception at the College of Agriculture in Puerto Rico at Mayaguez. At a, um, the staff was holding a reception, um, welcoming our group to Puerto Rico. It was 78 degrees and humid. <laughs> Welcome to tropical agriculture. I, I d didn't come with any information, but I was quickly learned. For the next 10 days, I saw a wide variety of uh, production and processing plants and research. And it blew away the uh, lack of sophistication I had and knowledge that I even knew about tropical agriculture. And that, that information became foundational in many different ways in my life. I learned about wet seasons and dry seasons. Um, I saw the root crops, taro and tanya and cassava and yam, which are much more commonplace now. Uh, we saw the fruit, fruit fruits like uh, guava and tasted them in the field. Oh, the taste of fresh papaya just picked from a tree. We saw soils, we saw soil profiles, we saw grasses. Um, I have notes about, to ad nauseum, about grasses that I saw. I wish, I, <laughs> I wish I'd paid more attention now. But. There were pigeon peas and sugar cane and uh, the Libby tomato fields for the processing plant. Uh, one day, I can remember standing in the rainforest in the seeing the plant structure and the dense plant population that I had never seen before in my life. That was amazing. Today, I'm still impressed with the sugar cane crop, crop and how it must be as hard as nails to grow that crop and then harvest it. The cane cutters that went into the fields and cut the crops. And then we saw the um, oh, cranes that lifted the sugar cane onto huge trucks and trucked it to the, the mill. All that work just to produce white granulated sugar for us and brown sugar so we could make cookies and cakes and also the byproduct uh, like bagasse. Other highlights were seeing the uh, glow of the bacteria on fish in phosphorescent bay. <laughs> and, that, and that was the evening that we had been to Arecibo Arecibo Observatory, the largest radio telescope in the world. You know, when we were there, they told us it wouldn't last another 20, 25 years because of the structure of the mountains. It's still there. But I understand it's a funding issue in 2017 that may, may shut it down. And our bus, we didn't turn over. We're not the ones that turned over. <laughs> But we did run out of gas yes. <laughs> way, on the way from Mike West to San Juan. And, and I have in my notes that we ate our sandwiches while they found gas for us. So guidance that, that has lived in my life that I heard on that trip was one of the uh, Puerto Rican scientists said, Go to the area where the crops are grown to work on the problems of the crops. Well, that's a good one. And here's another one. You must know the country and you must know the people before you make a move. 
You need to listen to those people. Very simple statement, but that is pretty amazing. At the, uh, we saw over six stations and substations. We visited them, saw their crops, heard people talk to us. Um, but at Rio Piedras, um, Dr. Arturo Rocas described the, his program for advanced training for Puerto Rican uh, scientists. He talked about they t took young, dedicated uh, scientists who'd had a BS, and then they sent them to the United States for the next degree, whether it be a master's or a PhD, and then brought them back, and they, they, that's the way they grew their um, educated professionals. Another piece of advice came from Lloyd Crowder, Dr. Lloyd Crowder and um, Dr. Harry McDonald. They took Mel and me to dinner one evening in San Juan at a restaurant, and I had found that kind of unusual for faculty to take students out, but they wanted to prepare us for international living. <clears throat> and Dr. Crowder t told us, when you're invited to eat with some in the local community, take very small amounts <laughs> because it Custom may require you to go back and get one more serving or another serving. And an another thing he said, it, you may avoid foodborne illness. <laughs> I have three vivid memories of times when I did not listen to him. <laughs> so what did I bring back from Puerto Rico? Well, in, in Nepal, Mel was the director of the CIMIT Corn Improvement Program, and in that funding, there was funding for training Nepali professionals. And so we looked at the people, he looked at the people working in the programs, those that, were ex that had a passion for it, and they then came to the United States or the UK for training. And then they returned to Nepal and with a PhD or maybe a master's and kept that program going, so <coughs> increasing the professional staff. very much similar to what we'd heard the training program for Puerto Rico. I, I learned over time and started in Puerto Rico that community development takes listening. It takes time. You have to listen to the local people if you're going to um, achieve any changes. You have to respect their opinions, give them space to talk. Um, so working with people across different cultures and languages and regional backgrounds has many similarities. And I found this true whether it was with the government of leaders or the farmers in Nepal, or it was with administrators or students at a small private college, or with uh, volunteers working in a senior nutrition and services program in southwest Kansas. Yeah, I needed to take, take time, listen to them before I made that move, before I made a change. And on our farm today, uh, our son uh, and his family host international students uh, from a small college, and they come to our farm for a day, and they climb on the machinery, and they see the crops, and they really seem to enjoy that and get a perspective to, of rural, rural living and agriculture take back to their their countries. And we host um, end users of, of our commercial, <coughs> our commodities. They, they visit the fields, they see it harvested, and they then know where the product came and they return to China or Mexico um, for the product. So what I brought back was I, a real definite um, interest in promoting the global aspect uh, in, in my community and with our farming operation. Chris Ween is our next speaker, and I think uh, you don't have slides, right? No slides. So, 1968, uh, I was a graduate student at Cornell in the veg crops department, uh, had just finished a master's degree Grew up in Ontario, knew nothing about the tropics, had never been, and along came this opportunity. 
But also another opportunity presented itself, and that was the Cornell Philippine program, which had faculty from Cornell, College of Agriculture, and graduate students from Cornell, as well as graduate students from the Philippines, come to Cornell, do coursework, and then go back do their thesis research. And I'd gotten interested in the tropics, and I was trying to think in getting ready for this, how did I get interested in the tropics? Well, uh, I played soccer with uh, Jamaican undergraduates at Guelph. That was one. And then here at Cornell, my office mates were Egyptians, Burmese, uh, Korean, Filipino. And I guess I got interested in agriculture in other places. So when this opportunity came, I had already signed up to become a graduate student uh, to the Cornell Philippine program. So the trip was in January, the uh, trip to the Philippines for two years to do graduate thesis re research uh, happened in June. So I was all set already and quite convinced that this is what I wanted to do. But it was wonderful to have the confirmation of this trip to say, hey, this is great. I enjoy this. And I'm so glad that uh, Janet provided the pictures, because mine have long been <laughs> discarded, lost, etc. But there was, that's first of all, escaping Ithaca in January, you all know what that's about. But also, to see agriculture in a totally different way, uh, a different kind of agriculture, going around looking at these strange crops I'd never seen before, uh, watching uh, strange growths on the telephone wires. I mean, you grow up in Ontario, there's nothing growing on telephone wires. <laughs> and here was the Spanish moss hanging on there. I said, huh? <laughs> so that it just, you know, one of those impressions. If I had a picture, I probably would have shown you that. <laughs> but you can imagine. Uh, so the, the trip itself was a wonderful eye-opener and getting together with faculty and students uh, and comparing notes afterwards in the spring semester about that experience. And then later on, to me, the, the important thing was to have this first comprehensive look at agriculture in one place. And I've traveled and worked in many other places. I've never had that chance again. But to see not just the crops which I was interested in, but the soils, the animal husbandry, uh, the, the cultural systems to some extent, although that wasn't really part of the, the, the trip, but getting this experience of going around a, a whole area and getting all these different uh, aspects of it is, has been unique and wonderful, and I'm sure glad that uh, uh, I was able to take part in that. So coming down to the present day, I want to thank uh, KV, who brought me up to date on what the course is doing now, because I thought, well, heck, it's, they're just doing the same thing, getting on a bus and <laughs> running around India instead of Puerto Rico nowadays. But it, no, it's changed quite a lot. And perhaps when he talks later on, uh, there's involvement of students from the country, which is a big change from what it was before. And that, I think, is important, because we did go around more touristy and yes, we talked to local professionals, but we really didn't interact with students uh, on the trip itself. But then the other question I have is, OK, in this day and age, you're not some kid growing up in Ontario never been to the tropics before. Let me just ask here, the students that are here, how many of you have been to the tropics before? Hands up. Anybody not? You see? And that's the thing. And in this day and age, is that what we want to have? Or is this still necessary for students who have an interest but haven't had the opportunity? And are there other courses now that are perhaps more relevant to students than this one is 50 years later, even with the improvements that have been made? And I'll leave it there. Hopefully, we'll have a discussion afterwards. Bill Fry, you're up next. All right. Well, um, 
it's, it's really a pleasure to be here, although I have to say that when the major criterion for being invited to give a speech is because you're old. Uh, you know, that's, that's not such a compliment. Really. But... Beats the alternative. It does beat the alternative. Um, so I have not a clue as to why I went on that trip. Um, I, I went on a lark. Um, I was a lab rat. I went to the greenhouse three times in my graduate career. The rest of the time was in a lab, and I was a biochemist primarily. But I learned quite a bit, and I thought it would be interesting to see some, um, some tropical agriculture. In fact, we did. Um, <laughs> there's a, a Dave Splitter looking at papaya with anthracnose and bunched up. George Abawi is in the middle, Ronnie, uh, with cassava. And Dave Thurston, um, with some others, is looking at some sugar cane. Um, but I wanted to subtitle this talk as uh, actually the corruption of an innocent, and that innocent would have been me uh, of course. <clears throat> from um, the Midwest. I didn't really know much of anything. I learned something today uh, about uh, what things were like. Um, and one of the corruptors was H. David Thurston, one of the organizers of, of this trip. And D Dave was a plant pathologist. He had worked in the, with the Rockefeller Foundation for 11 years prior to being appointed at Cornell in 1967 uh, as a plant, path, a plant pathologist. So here's a picture of Dave. Uh, he smoked like a chimney until uh, he got emphysema, which was not pleasant at all. Um, but one of the reasons that he corrupted me is Dave was an expert on potato late blight. And this is uh, a picture of a potato leaflet with a late blight lesion. And I've worked on that disease and that pathogen um, almost ever since. And Dave was tremendously helpful in um, you know, providing a lot of expertise concerning that. So that was a wonderful thing. So instead of being corruption of an innocent, I think really that trip was the education of an innocent or an ignorant person, if you will. And um, what I wanted to mention were the mentors on the trip. It made a tremendous difference to me. I learned a little bit about tropical agriculture and something about my own students at Cornell um, has been nice. So Dave Thurston was an inter <laughs> one of the first international agriculturists, and he took pictures everywhere. And um, those pictures are available online. Uh, he was really an amazing um, uh, guy, um, remarkably fastidious and meticulous. Um, here he is. Corrupting me and uh, Joe Shetska. Um, and what he's telling me is how you control late blight. And he was really proud of this next picture. He says, In Minnesota, uh, we shoot it. Uh, so this is Dave's picture. Um, I, I got it from him. And he was breeding potatoes that were resistant to late blight. And the ones that didn't make it got shot. Uh, here's a better picture of Dave in the Toluca Valley in Mexico. Um, this was in 1972, I think, um, and Dave was instrumental in, um, obviously, organizing the trip. It is a wheat field, Johnny, yeah. This is the Nomado de Toluca in the background. And I um, wanted to show this picture because one of the other uh, major players was located in the Toluca Valley, and that's John Niederhauser. Uh, John Niederhauser went to the Toluca Valley in the late 1940s. This is a picture of John when he was in the late 1940s. Um, he was winner of the World Food Prize in 1990. And he also was an expert on uh, potato late blight. Here's another picture of John standing up and very typical, working with a group of Mexicans. You notice they're working and he's observing. Um, but one of the wonderful stories, and Janet, you mentioned this, know, know the situation. So when John first went to the Toluca Valley as a maize and bean pathologist, uh, he went to that valley and he said, why don't you grow potatoes? Because he had worked on potatoes in, um, at Cornell. He was a Cornell grad. And they said, they don't grow here. And John mm -hmm. said, John didn't listen to anything. Actually, he never did all his life. Uh, he said, so he planted some potatoes. And... This John, and when they came up, they just got blasted with late blight. And John said, oh, I know. That's late blight. I've been working on immune potatoes to late blight at Cornell uh, in the program of Dr. Donald Reddick, pictured here. And he has these immune potatoes. So he, 
John ordered some potatoes from Cornell. He planted them. He told the farmers, he says, you are going to see a miracle. So these potatoes came up and <laughs> blasted with late light. But this led to a really important discovery. And that is that the, the pathogen population in the Toluca Valley was different from everywhere else. And it's very, very diverse. And it also illustrated that these R genes, resistance genes, are ephemeral in terms of their effect. Another thing that John discovered working with his Mexican scientists was that um, the, this population was sexually reproducing, uh, the, the Phytophthora infestans population, that is. And, um, you get that. And um, that was the only place in the world where it was. It turns out that the, the central Mexico is likely the center of origin of this organism. And John was one of the first to describe it. And Janet, another thing you said about knowing your community. Um, John Niederhauser and Norman Borlaug worked together to start Little League Baseball in, well, actually in Toluca. It became very uh, popular. In 1954, I think they started. In 1958, they went to the World Series in Williamsport, and they won it in their category, which is just really sort of amazing. So John was revered by Mexicans. Um, this is my last slide. And what it illustrates is um, several of my students. Um, Jorge Andrade is a guy on the left. Um, he's, from, he's currently at the International Potato Center in Lima, Peru. He said that this course was the best course he'd taken at Cornell. He didn't take my course. Um, <laughs> the guy in the back opposite me is Eduardo Mizabuti. He was dean of research at Vesoza University um, in Vesoza, um, Brazil, until just very recently. He also went on the trip. And uh, actually, the guy in the front, the Israeli, uh, didn't go on the trip. He'd been a postdoc with me. So I want to thank this trip. I learned a lot. And the mentors have been spectacular. Uh, and also, I would say that the, the opportunity for my students at Cornell has been really spectacular. So that's where I'll stop. So you fell in love with late flight as a result I, of this trip? I did. I, I never knew that. <laughs> I always knew he was in love with it, but I never knew why. <laughs> Don Cass, you're next. OK. Well, I was told that I was invited. I thank um, Ronnie for inviting me. And that I was supposed to, that everyone was supposedly um, supposed to represent as one of the people, the professors who went on the course. And the course, when we went in 69, we had Dr. Thurston and Dr. McDowell from Animal Science and um, Dr. McDonald, Harry McDonald from Crop Science and Dr. Drozdov, who was my professor, who was the soil scientist. So I was supposed to talk about him. So... We have this picture. It was the last picture I took with Dr. Drozdov. That was in 1995. And I got here. I guess I'll go to the next slide. I arrived in Cornell in 1967, same as Janet. And I was interested in nitrogen fixing algae. And in the summer of 67, my major professor, Dr. Drozdov, went to the laboratory of Dr. Joanna Doberina in um, who did research on nitrogen-fixing bacteria for the Brazilian Ministry of Agriculture outside Rio de Janeiro. And they made an arrangement where I would spend the summer of 68 in her laboratory. That was the whole start of my tropical experience, because before that I had absolutely no tropical experience. I was then persuaded that the other thing was that um, Dr. Kingsbury, who was the algae person here at that time, was on sabbatical. So there was no way I could do a thesis in algae unless I waited a year, so no one was out for doing that. So I was then persuaded to change my research interest to nitrogen-fixing bacteria and put Dr. Martin Alexander on my committee. And But I wasn't allowed to take the course. I objected violently because the other student, the other Dr. Drozdov students all went on the course. And I said, why not me? And he said, oh, you don't have any tropical experience. Because then when I went on the course, I discovered no one had tropical experience. <laughs> but this, this was a stricture only for me, as was often the case with Dr. Drozdov. He had a rule that only applied to me. <laughs> and after passing the summer of 68 in Dr. Doberiner's laboratory, 
I was deemed to have sufficient experience in the tropics to take the course in 1969. So my involvement. So on the trip, most of the soils work, although Dr. Drossel was there, was, we had Dr. Fred Beinroth of the University of Puerto Rico, and he more or less did all the soils work. I mean, he had dug all the profiles, and he explained everything. And the other thing we got from Dr. Drossel, for Dr. Drossel, he said, well, he's making a lot of assumptions, never telling us what the assumptions were, but he, you know, cast a few aspersions on Dr. Beinroth's expertise. And then, of course, Dr. McDowell was the professor I thought it took the most active role in the, you know, we would go to these places and the Puerto Rican scientists would explain everything and we'd let it go with that, but not, not Bob McDowell. He would grab the microphone and then give his view on what we were seeing. So we always got him thing. And as I said, Dr. Thurston, he was the only one whose wife did not come along. So we mostly interacted with Dr. Thurston in the evenings because over rum. And uh, <laughs> no, but that was actually when I met Dr. Thurston. I mean, you know, we became friends for like 45 years after that, but it started on the trip. So that was a great influence, actually, of the trip on my life. And then we were most expressed with uh, someone also mentioned Dr. Jose Vincente Chandler, who's still alive. And actually, he was. He was a po he was the first Puerto Rican in the Olympics, and he represented Puerto Rico in I think nineteen forty something. So how old is he? Ninety five, mm -hmm. but he's still alive in Puerto Rico, and he was very famous for working on um, uh, tropical grasses. He got these tremendous uh, production of tropical grasses, which no one thought it was possible, but he put on a lot of mineral nitrogen fertilizer. When I was there, you know, I was supposedly trying to do biological nitrogen fixation, so I wasn't too impressed. You know, they, a lot of people criticized him because they said, because the Australians were doing a lot of work with legumes, you know, associating grasses with legumes, and the legumes would supply the nitrogen. So, and he was using mineral nitrogen fertilizer, so it was a little controversial. And I remember visiting a dairy operation where the cows were fed citrus pulp. The great enlivening force of the trip was Dr. McDowell's wife whom, if you ever met, was quite a character. And we called her Dottie. And in the th we did mention that she always organized. She was also very much with the students. Because I remember we used to stop. Some days there was no lunch provided at the stops. And she would organize a whole bunch of students the night before to make sandwiches. And she would have everything. So she was very, actually very supportive of the students. But Dr. Thurston always felt she overdid things by dancing with the bus driver at the final beach party, because he never stopped talking about that. I mean, he, that was, <laughs> there was no, no discussion of Mrs. McDowell on the trip without him talking about how she danced with the bus driver. And then there was this lady, Miss Bossel. So remember at the end, we had this sort of fancy party on the beach. That was the, that was the highlight of the trip. The last day we had a beach party and they came out with this huge buffet of food, you know, which, and there was this lady, Miss Bastos, who represented Puerto Rico. And I was already very involved in my, in my uh, thesis research because I needed a uh, tetraploid paspolum notatum seed for my thesis research. So I got sent after the um, the course. I didn't go back with the rest of the students. I was sent to Tifton, Georgia to get seen. I really felt very, here I was a 23-year-old graduate student. I was told, rent a car, you know, fly. They flew me to Jacksonville and I rented a car and I went to the University of Florida to talk to people. And I went to Tifton, Georgia. And I talked to Glenn Burton, who was the big pastor man then at that time. And then I drove to Atlanta and I flew back to Ithaca and I already oh, this was, you know, this was a life I had never known as a graduate student. You know? <laughs> so <laughs> so and that was very good. And then, then we had, I know Janet says she doesn't remember this, but I remember we had weekly sessions in the course of the semester and there was a discussion group and Dr. Drozdov led it. Some people were like identified as a soils group. And we had a weekly discussion about something. I don't think people made presentations, but I remember Vincent, Dr. Vincente Chandler came to Cornell during the year and he talked to the group. And very um, significantly, I remember that one session, there was a snowstorm and Dr. Drozdorf was somewhere and he couldn't get back to Ithaca. <laughs> 
<laughs> so he missed the session. It was canceled. All right, so after finishing my master's degree, serving in the Peace Corps in Brazil, reserving to Cornell to do my PhD, I spent another year and a half in Brazil doing thesis research where I was at the Peace Corps. I went to work for the uh, Tropical Agriculture Research and Training Center, Katia, in Guatemala in 68. I was transferred to Costa Rica in 82. And so then I was in Costa Rica when the course, after the bus accident, they decided to move the course to Costa Rica. So they went to Costa Rica for seven years. And since I was there, I always sort of helped receive the group and reorganize as they came to Katia and some other places in Costa Rica. And I really had already decided to make a career in tropical agriculture before I took the course. And I saw, I guess, the major influence was really um, Dr. Dobereiner, because I worked with her first, and then we stayed. Uh, even when I moved away from nitrogen fixation, I came back, then I worked with nitrogen fixing trees, and we collaborated again. So I actually collaborated with her till the end of her life. And so, and the course, no, it, you know, it did, nothing happened in the course to say, no, I shouldn't go into tropical agriculture. No, I mean, it was, it was a positive uh, experience, but it wasn't uh, like a deciding influence, because I figured I already knew the tropics. And Puerto Rico wasn't really the tropics, you know, because I said most of the people in Puerto Rico subsisted on food stamps at that time and weren't into agriculture. So I had to only reinforce my decision. And then in 2000, there's this incident which uh, isn't sort of swept under the rug. Um, Dr. Thurston decided, I don't know whose decision this was, that they were going to have a reunion of the course. And they decided to have it in Costa Rica in 2000. And it was going to be in his fancy hotel. And I said to Dave Thurston, I said, look, I said, many of the former participants are probably earning about $1,000 a month in their positions in developing countries and are not going to pay $2,000 to spend a week in Costa Rica. Well, he didn't listen to me. And so I even had suggestions to cheapen the course, but it did, no one listened to me, and only 20 students showed up. The other people who showed up were people who were like working for fertilizer companies who would pay their expenses. I remember Dr. Conklin paid for his two children <laughs> to come to the seminar. And then everything else went wrong, too, because then there was a general strike in Costa Rica during... <laughs> <laughs> during the, 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 the reunion, and we couldn't go anywhere in Costa Rica, so we were sort of stuck in San Jose. So Dr. Thurston always cursed us. Yes, I was actually thinking of not coming for this because Dr. Thurston just sort of tell me, don't ever do anything more with, you know, IRD, IIRD 605. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now then I'm supposed to talk. I was told I was the... Uh, uh, source person for that. I'm talking too long? All right. Well, I'll go through that. Right. I'm supposed to talk about Dr. Drausdorfels. He, he grew up in Chicago, and then he did, went to the uh, University of Wisconsin, where he got his master's and PhD. And then he, um, he st went to work for the Soil Conservation Service. I got various versions of this story that he was, didn't like teaching or something, so he did soil survey. In the, in the southeast and Midwest. Then he, then he did, he got, uh, well, he got, then he got involved in this, um, where is this slide, something missing? Oh, I guess without us organ here. All right, well then, uh, they, they like said, they went around the, the south as a, a soil survey. But then he was assigned to the University of Florida in 1941 to do research on tongue trees, because tongue oil was essential for the war effort. And so he did research on, um, the nutrition of tongue trees. And then, in 1950, he was sent to Central America to look for adequate soils for the production of manila hemp, which was another of the crops that was produced in the Philippines that was threatened by the Japanese invasion. Though, actually, they were already growing manila hemp in Costa Rica in 1929. So um, there was a project set up, and what was funny was that when at some point in my life in Costa Rica, we were assigned to one of the houses that was built by this project. And there's a picture of Dr. Drozdov and I in the house that the Manila Hem Project built. And Manila Hem is actually still grown. It's, it's a very high quality fiber. They use it for making tea bags and tracing paper. 
All right. So then, all right. Well, all right. So then, after a 31-year career in foreign government service, always willing to move his family wherever service is deemed most needed, Dr. Drazo accepted the position of Cornell's first professor of tropical soils under a Ford Foundation grant that did much to fortify tropical agriculture research at Cornell. I think there were they, all the people were. I think McDowell too. Everyone. There was a there was a tropical agriculture person in every department under this Ford Foundation grant. He taught a course in soils of the tropics and participated in chief soil source. I don't know when he stopped coming on the trip, but for several years he did. He published over 60 scientific papers, edited two books, Soils of the Human Tropics and the Diversity of Soils in the Tropics, and he received awards. They were two children, and apparently this is his grandson, who looks just like him, and who is a professor at... Um, Tulsa Community College. So he retired in 1976, and he and his wife passed away in 78. And then he married another man, and he died in 1998. So that's it. That's all I have. Okay. Thank you, Don. So we're getting close to out of time. If there's students here who have to make their next class, why well, they can, you know, quietly move out. But we'll take just a little more time. I think it's important for you to know, kind of how the course, you know, based on. Chris's comments that were questioning the sort of current relevance of the course. You should know that, you know, the course has evolved a lot. It started in Puerto Rico where it was just focused on production agriculture, then, Santa, uh, then the Dominican Republic, then uh, Mexico. It began to take on some of the social issues. Costa Rica, uh, a lot of the environmental uh, issues, but we had to leave. We had to leave Costa Rica because the social scientists said, you know, there weren't enough social challenges there. So then Honduras, and and then Ecuador, uh, and then finally uh, we shifted to India, and and K. B. Raman took over, and it's been 17 years. The course is now quite structured with, you know, rather. Define, well-defined learning outcomes. KB, you might just like to say a, a few words about the current course. Oh, wow. Well, we have over uh, you know, 25 faculty from different parts of the university who have been involved during the last uh, 17 years. So I'd like to recognize all those faculty who have contributed to learning outcomes. That's number one. Number two is that it has been a win-win for all the faculty who have participated because what they have done in the course, they have brought it to the classrooms to enrich the learning in terms of case studies. So one of the case study which has been developed won the European award for, uh, you know, through this experiential learning program. The second outcome I would say is that the faculty, both at Cornell end, have linked up with the faculty at India end, and they have identified amazing grant opportunities which has helped to bring in students both ways you know students going on experiential learning on the other side and students coming from india and doing their degree program the third outcome i would say is that with the help of rani we were able to actually bring in connect with one of the most prominent alums of cornell which is ratan tata he was exposed to the learning outcomes of the course and he made a huge grant to Cornell of about $50 million in order to help, you know. Not too much of it came. Not to too us. much came to us, but I think, you know, we really put a lot of effort, and I think Ronnie should be recognized for that. Because I think, uh, you know, people don't know about it, but I think, you know, there's a lot of, at least about 10 year effort there. And I think the course really put that, you know, thing in the right direction. Students who have graduated, and I think you know, you made the best point is what do you get out of it? It's more than what do you get, how do you use it in your own career development? And I think you know, we I can give you examples of Josh Cobb, you know, who came on this course as a plant breeder. After the course, he decided to get into Italy and to do international work. He never want, I mean, you know, he's still working. That's where at, he is. That's where he is. So there's a lot of examples like that. And connecting Cornell students with students in developing countries right from the beginning has been a very, very crucial thing because right from the beginning, 14 classes, they are digitally connected. Those students actually come over here, they work with Cornell students. Cornell students, when they go back, they connect with the same students and the faculty. So there is this lifelong experience after the course, they're still connected over social media sites such as Facebook, and uh, you know that has been a 
great stuff and we are going to be celebrating our 50th anniversary of the course in India. All of you guys are welcome, whoever can come. And uh, those who cannot come, we January can connect to the right? January the 6th. And we are hoping for a very important uh, chief guest there and you know, we are keeping our fingers crossed. So. Well, we're, I, we had thought about the panel taking questions, but you know we're, we're actually completely out of time and we may have somebody else coming into the room when we need to clean up. So let's just thank all of our panel.